I'm very happy that Pascal kindly agreed um, to give a presentation, a very timely one, on neutrality in the new Cold War. Um, and he's eminently qualified, first and foremost, because he taught at Temple University. He's done a lot of research, studied at the University of Freiburg, and is now at the uh, University of Kyoto, one of Japan's former imperial universities uh, in the former imperial capital. That's something that I think people in Kyoto never forget to mention. Uh, they still think it's the real capital. It's just <laughs> no. tr temporarily borrowed to Tokyo. <laughs> so, uh, without further ado, gravity is a sort of wit, as Shakespeare said. So you came here to listen to Pascal, not to me. Um, so just a few things. If you didn't get invited to our events and would like to, uh, send me an email or ask for my business card and will I do it to our list. Uh, you're on the record, I take it. Okay, so on the record. And um, welcome. Thank you so much. Well, thank, thank you very much, Robert. And thank you very much, everybody, for joining today. It's my great pleasure talking to you about the, the subject that I've been researching for the last uh, six or seven years since my, since my PhD, basically, that which I did at the National Graduate Institute for Policy Studies, which is not too far away in Ropongi. I've been interested in this topic partially because, well, I'm Swiss, and if a Swiss studies international relations, why not make it about neutrality and keep it easy for everybody? But moreover, because like during my PhD, I realized that there's... That there's a lot that could be unearthed. And one of the important things is that we don't have in international relations any kind of theory or, or not even a theoretical framework of how to think about neutral states or neutral actors in international relations. And I've been, uh, I've been working on that, and one of my main goals of the next three or so, three or four years, will be to actually write that kind of theoretical approach, how to look at actors that kind of, when there's a war, they don't join either side, and when there's no war, they also don't try and join alliances, or like, you know, just the ones that do other things. In international relations, we often use the term hedging in order to describe states that kind of do, like, play with both sides, but that, that term, the terminology is inherently imperfect, and there is good reasons why it would make sense to to conceptualize states that are not completely committed in an alliance as something as something else. And I would like to go through this with you and, and kind of give you an intellectual, uh, my approach at how to think about states that don't want to commit completely. Uh, and um, some states call themselves out rightly neutral, other states don't. But uh, my claim is if we look at it in a, from a theoretical perspective, um, it makes sense, especially when we look at it from the, from the viewpoint of these states. So what I want to do is I first introduce some a theoretical framework that I'm working on. I will uh, interlace this with uh, three case studies that I would like to, to present to you and then hopefully in the end come to a conclusion within 45 or so minutes in order to have still ta uh, time for, for conversation. And I hope not... Um, one thing I must say, one thing that I learned of the especially during the, the PhD, is how valuable it is to present things. To, to talk and to present, and then if things are not are imperfect, you, you, can, you have discussions and you, and you make this part of the, of the research process and of the thinking process. So thank you, and I, I look at this as a, as a thinking together kind of event. So anything that strikes you as weird or as, as off, please, uh, please do bring it in, and I do hope we can discuss this. So the, yeah, the task would be for me to give you a kind of a useful way of how to think about neutrals. And I put neutrals in quotation marks because neutral is like inherently difficult to, to define as a concept. It's a very fuzzy concept because you have as many different neutralities as you have neutral states, <laughs> and even more than those because you also have, to, you have those states who kind of behave neutrally but don't even want to call themselves that. Um, and if you, if you ask a Swiss, an Austrian, and, an, and a, uh, a, a Turkmen, who are all like live in neutral countries that call themselves neutral, they will give you three different definitions of what, the, what their neutrality means. And if you ask the Swiss from today, and from 1960s, and from the 1920s what their neutrality is, they will have different definitions, because it changes over time as well. 
Uh, much of what I'm going to talk about is either in a book that I recently edited together with two colleagues uh, called um, uh, Neutral Beyond the Cold, where we, where we were looking in like 16 essays um, with other scholars uh, at places that are currently neutral or, or kind of leaning toward neutrality. And we had, we had the fortune of publishing this, uh, of finishing writing and everything in January 2022, right before basically everything started changing with the uh, invasion of Ukraine, of course. Um, but it was one of the first attempts at trying to look at neutrality beyond the Cold War, because a lot of the historical, a lot of the studies ended, uh, end the narrative with about neutral states in 1990 or 1991. And then the other one um, is an article that came out last week in Foreign Policy in Defense of Neutrals, where I uh, kind of make a couple of the arguments that I will present to you here. So if you want to um, reread that, you would you would find some of it there. Um, and you might see from this from the title also that I am personally in favor of using neutrality policies as a way of trying to help stabilize uh, the international um, uh, an, an international system. But I will get I will get to that. I will make three arguments and try to um, try to. support support that or show you why I think of neutrals like this. One, neutrality doesn't go away. It just changes shape over time. Secondly, neutrality is anywhere and everywhere a reaction to conflict, not something sui, sui generis. It doesn't come out of itself. It's, 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 it's inspired by something else that happens. And in the nature of conflict of the 21st century will define the nature of, its, uh, of the neutralities that we will see from here on. I mean, I called this in the title of, the, of this uh, talk, the, the, the New Cold War. I mean, whatever we will call it. We don't even have yet a real proper name for the 30 years between 1991 and 2022. We were living in the post-Cold War era. We are still in the post-Cold War era, but there's good chances to believe that, you know, the international system is now changing, and we will probably give a proper name to the post-Cold War. I do dearly hope it's not going to be the second interwar period. I don't, I don't know as what we will remember it. We don't have a proper name, and we don't have a proper name for what we're in now. But it seems that we are going towards something different, with a rather, an, a, rather a multipolar world with uh, the, the US, uh, Russia, China, and so on. But we'll get, it, we'll get to that. Um, let me get to my argument number one. Neutrality doesn't go away, but it changes. Why do I say that? It's because <laughs> whenever, whenever there's one of the big kind of changes of the international system, it, it regularly happens that you get these texts that will proclaim the end or the decline of neutrality. So this is a very important book, a very good one, actually, from 1953. Niels Ervik, who wrote his dissertation about the decline of neutrality between 1941 to, uh, 1914 to 41, and he ends it with, you know, in this new world where the United Nations governs over everything and law, uh, war is outlawed, neutrals will, will fade away. I mean, the old concept of neutrality will go away and it will be part of history. Well, uh, along comes the Cold War. We have new neutrals. We have, we have Finland, we have Austria, we have Yugoslavia, we have a non-aligned movement. Um, but then the Cold War ends, and a uh, Swiss historian that I actually also like, but I just don't agree with him, wrote a book called The Dead End Neutrality. Uh, he published it in 1997. So most of these things were written around, you know, 93, 94, 95, um, um, basically making the argument that uh, now that the Cold War is over, unipolar world, I mean, we, we, we don't have communism anymore. You don't need the neutrals. The neutrals will go away. This is, e this is the end. And even Switzerland should finally get over it and, and realize that it's useless. So just get rid of the policy, join the EU, join NATO, and so on, um, because it's, it's over anyhow. And sure enough, in 2023, we, still, we have articles again which say that in the new world, uh, neutrality is obsolete in the 21st century. It doesn't make any sense. We live in a completely different environment. So it will go away. It's just a question of time until those um, remaining neutrals will realize that. And it's quite fascinating, you know, with, with a certain regularity you find this. But then if you look at what happens to neutral states or when neutrality comes up, you actually find that it is wars that give that that birth neutralities swiss neutrality is an outcome of the of the way the napoleonic wars ended in 1815 
um, at the Congress of Vienna, and well, Switzerland stuck for it, to it for 200 years. But it was decided in 1815 in Vienna and put into writing and became the first time that a neutrality was like codified under international law. The, the civil war in you know, Netherlands, Belgium, the Belgian Revolution, was the moment or was the reason why Belgian neutrality was born in the, in the late 1830s. And that one lasted until 18, uh, 1914 and was ended by the First World War. The Belgians stopped being neutral when they were invaded by the Germans, and that was the reason why the British and the French then declared war on Germany and this, uh, at the start of the, of, the, of the First World War. But that First World War actually gave rise to Danish and Norwegian neutrality, who both stayed neutral together with a couple of others. Um, but the Second World War destroyed those two. They, uh, the, the, the Danes and the Norwegians never were neutral again because they were both then invaded in the in the Second World War, but in the Second World War, we had the Irish, the Spanish, the Portuguese, and the Turks that remained neutral. <coughs> now, as soon as the Second World War was over, um, the last three, they basically gave up their neutralities, but the Irish maintained it, and the, and the Cold War then started. They joined um, NATO and are not considered neutral anymore, but then we had in 55, and well, in the late 40s and early um, 50s, then the Austrians, the Finns, and of course the Yugoslavs that kind of start being neutral or non-aligned. And I sometimes use these words interchangeably, although they, there is a difference. Um, we might talk about it. Um, but, and the Austrians, the Finns, and the Yugoslavs were very important neutrals during the, during the Cold War. Um, without, the, without the Finns, who were kind of running a pro-Soviet uh, neutrality, um, we might not have had the, secure, the Conference for Security and Cooperation in Europe in 75, that very most important kind of joint um, ex, uh, exercise to actually come to an agreement of how to structure um, like uh, uh, North Atlantic security from the US all the way to, uh, to Siberia, where you had 50 foreign ministers meeting. This, the, the, this, the Conference for Security and Cooperation in, uh, in Europe, CSCE, is really a, was a milestone of cooperation in the Cold War, a milestone of detente, and it came along because the Soviets told the Finns, "Can you please pitch it to the to the Americans and the Europeans? Because if we do it, they won't they won't uh, they won't do it anyhow." And the Finns did that. They sent out invitations, said, "Hey guys, in 69, 70, we should talk." And then you had like uh, um, some neutral co cooperation and collaboration to make that thing a success. So the the Finns were actually quite were quite important. And of course, we enter now the, the current era, 2022. The Finns are not neutral anymore. The Swedes also said they want to join uh, NATO. Um, and some observers take this as a sign that neutrality is again in decline. But well, no, it's more or less just uh, some neutrals leave, but others are usually born. So the question is not, uh, will we still have neutrals? The question is, who will be neutral? And in what sense? In what sense will they be neutral? So that's what I would... I want to work on um, also with you. What neutrality? What are we talking about? So, first of all, I want to talk only about neutral countries because we could also um, talk about other neutral actors, you know, like the international, the, the Red Cross, the YMCA, or the, um, the International Olympic Committee. There are international institutions that always have this problem that they kind of are supposed to work with everybody for different reasons. And then they can or they can, and they are then constantly under pressure. So those are institutions that, that are also kind of like depending on neutrality policies. But let's leave them aside for a while now. Let's just talk about neutral countries. We can talk about them in two ways. One, we can talk about states that officially call themselves um, neutral. And here we have either states that have neutrality as part of their constitution or the legal, their, um, their laws. One of the two, like where they where there's a fixed prescription that okay the state is neutral. Switzerland, Austria, um, Turkmenistan have neutrality in their constitutions. So in, if they wanted to give that up, they actually I mean Turkmenistan not because Turkmenistan is a is a dictatorship, but the other two they would need to have referendums to give it up. Whereas um, states like uh, Finland and Sweden. They had neutrality only as part of their foreign policy principles, not as a legal requirement for the state. So both of them, during the Cold War, uh, Sweden and Finland just had, um, they put out, the government put out statements saying like, okay, this is our foreign policy approach, but there's nothing, nothing more than that. 
and these foreign policy papers, the white papers, then slowly changed also since the late 90s, um, dropping the word neutrality and uh, starting to use the word non-alignment. And then in 2022, it, they didn't need any kind of popular referendum or something to give that up because they basically just changed the foreign policy concept, right? Not the basic premise of how the state runs, which makes them somewhat different. But both of, both of, these, both of these types of neutral states basically have the word somewhere in their policy documents. And then we can also use neutrality, and it's often used like that as an analytical category. So you read that often in, in um, newspapers or magazines when, when um, journalists talk about, let's say, I'm going to bring that example later, the foreign policy of Oman in, um, in the Middle East as a neutral foreign policy because they kind of they talk to the Iranians, they talk to the Saudis, and, and so on. Um, but Oman itself doesn't have neutrality uh, in its, on, its, on its books. They are part of the non-aligned movement, but they do not otherwise try to kind of uh, allude to the concept. But it, might, it still makes sense sometimes to talk about these neutralist strategies in international relations as a form of neutrality. Or um, sometimes it also happens that you have countries where you've got a neutrality discourse where, like, let's say, the left, uh, one political party might think it might be a good idea to actually declare neutrality or change that or, or, or add it to the, to the constitution. And we can try to look at, at those types of countries and try to figure out why they would try to behave in a certain way or why certain groups um, argue for that. And again, we just leave non-state actors um, uh, like out of the picture for the moment. So I think the most important thing that I want to kind of propose of how to think about a neutral position from a theoretical viewpoint is that we often make, we, all, we have this attitude of thinking of neutrals as being caught between two sides, being in the middle. And actually in Japanese, the word, and, and Chinese too, the word for neutrality literally means to stand in the middle truly to stand in the middle. <laughs> but in my, my point is this is not a very useful way of imagining what, ne what neutrals are or do. It makes more sense to think of them in a, as a triangle, where the neutral here would be represented as a country A, and to the neutral there's two other states. And of course, it's, it's always more. It's always like multilateral, right? But let's, let's simplify it to the core. Um, B1 and B2, and the important thing here is that in, in, that in international relations, um, um, the way that countries are connected is always bilateral. So if all of these con countries are bilaterally connected with each other, it forms a triangle, right? B1 and B2 have a relationship between, between each other, but so does A with B1 and A with B2, right? And the point of the neutral, or that what, ne what neutrals then often try to, uh, to achieve, is to maintain peace while these B1 and B2 are at war, or a little bit less dramatic, at least in a, in a, in a very strong conflict. And this position is, to me, the, 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 the core of what it means that, is, that a state kind of has, has some form of neutrality policy. Try to maintain a friendly relationship with two countries that currently are unfortunately at war. It's literally being friends with enemies. Of course, not with your own enemies, being friends with, with states that are enemies between each other. Um, and that, that is difficult. <laughs> That's what then always creates these problems that B1 and B2, they will both tell A, why are you supporting my enemy? Why are you trading with the enemy? So a lot of US trade with the enemy acts, during the, especially during the Second World War, were then targeted at, 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 at stopping this, right? You should not trade with, with, with the people we fight. And, um, and we have like tons of, of, of examples of that also in the 19th century. Now, one important thing here is that we currently have three countries. We have war and we have peace. The interesting thing is we don't have neutrality yet. My point is that if we look at neutrality, then neutrality is only is here. Neutrality is always directed towards the conflict. Uh, Switzerland is not neutral to, to uh, Russia or to Ukraine, um, or let's say, um, like Switzerland in the Second World War wasn't really neutral toward uh, uh, Germany or neutral toward the United States. It was neutral toward the war that was going on between them. And the, when it comes to the economy or to diplomacy, um, 
uh, then these, the neutral countries will try to maintain normal relationships. That's a bit the thing. Neutral countries, because they are not at war, they, they have a normal relationship, and then they will try to continue what they have been doing before uh, and try to prevent being forced to change that but from, um, from either of the two. Um, now, the th third observation that is important is that neutrals are not part of the primary conflict, or they, stay, they try to not become part of the primary conflict, but they're always part of the larger conflict constellation. Um, they are usually not able to take them, they're never able to take themselves completely out. They will always be under pressure from, from either of the two to do something in, in one or the other way. My, my f favorite example is that if, we, if there was a man in the moon living on the other side of the moon, and that man in the moon had never heard of the war between Russia and Ukraine, um, and therefore has no position and doesn't support, doesn't send weapons to either, doesn't sanction either, the man in the moon, we would not call that person neutral. We would call it ignorant, uninformed, like outside, right? But it would not be a neutral position. It would just be a lack of, of, of any kind of involvement. The neutrals themselves, by the position they have, are always somehow connected to the war or to, to a conflict, but try to, to maintain a distance. And that, that position then um, creates, creates problems and creates uh, uh, challenges for neutrals and for the, for the belligerents too, of course, and has over, over the last two, 300 years then birthed a lot of um, international law on what you can and cannot do. And if you want to put the neutral position into, um, into Twitter terms, I would call it Hashtag not my war. That's what neutrals try to to um, to the position they try to defend. I am not. I'm not part of either of you two. I will keep my my own position for myself, and I will will keep a good relationship with both of you, or a certain relationship. For practical matters, uh, neutrals are never perfectly equal with everybody else. They usually have a better relationship with one or with the other, um, but not to that ex not to the extent then that they that they are completely al um, aligned with them. Um, and this this is especially true for for what you what you usually call occasional neutrality. Occasional neutrality was a thing, especially in the 19th century. You know, when uh, especially great powers sometimes chose I am neutral toward this conflict, but not to the other one. The U.S. was kind of uh, very good at that. The U.S. declared the South America out of, uh, I mean, hands off Monroe Doctrine. And when it comes to to the Europeans, we are neutral. We are not gonna we are not gonna join. Um, any wars of the French, the British, or the Russians, or the Germans against each other, because that makes no sense. So the U.S. had a very uh, 150 years of neutrality uh, policy, actually, that they defended quite fiercely. But that didn't mean that the U.S. was peaceful. Um, the U.S. still had its wars on its, on its own continent, and, and so on. It just meant it chose, <laughs> it chose the fights that it, that, it, that it wants to interact with. And then, whenever it's neutral, it will claim the rights of neutrality, meaning I have a right to, to trade with both, with the French and the British, even when they, when they are again at war with each other. And uh, the, the U.S. was always very, very um, angry when one of the two belligerents tried to stop uh, U.S. trade with, with uh, their respective enemies. Um, so, and this, this position is to me like best kind of captured or how old it is, just also by looking at the father of realism or who's considered the father of realism in international relations, who's Thucydides. There's this, anyone who has, has had an international relations class, you will have read uh, the Malian Dialogue, right? Which is where uh, Thucydides famously wrote, so, and the weak suffer what they must. It's about the Athenians, uh, um, the, this little island, uh, Melos, that was kind of between Sparta and Athens, and then the Athenians send a couple of diplomats there saying like, dear, dear uh, Melians, um, you've been neutral now for 40 years, but this cannot continue. You either join us and help us fight the Spartans or we kill all of you. And then the whole dialogue is about the Melians trying to make the Athenians understand, look, uh, I just don't want that. And, <laughs> and uh, the, 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 the core thing here is, the, to me, what the Melians said was, we want to be friends to you, and foe to neither. It's like this stereotypical kind of like 2,300 year old position of somebody trying to sell the idea, just let us be okay with you and the other guy, and you will win something out of that. Well, they didn't succeed in, in selling the idea in the end, they were, they were all um, eliminated very sadly, so neutrality um, approaches can go horribly wrong, horribly wrong. 
Um, but but it is this kind of this this in this this innate kind of the um, part of the structure of how states interact with each other and how some of them, especially like smaller ones that have nothing to win from a war of others, how they try, how they how they approach international relations. And we have a beautiful example of that in the case of Oman. You know this this kind of this kind of country in the Middle East that we don't usually hear something about, which is great. If you don't hear something about countries, that's usually good for the countries. <laughs> as soon as they are in the, in the media, it's usually not a good thing. So, but Oman is doing very, very, is, is kind of living this dictum very successfully. If you go to their, um, to their homepage of their um, foreign ministry, you find a beautiful ex uh, description of the basics of Omani foreign policy, and it's, it beautifully says there in the middle that the foreign policy of the Sultanate of Oman is founded on a profound and enduring vision of Oman as friend to all. And they've been doing this very successfully for the past 50 years. The, the JCPOA, the Joint Comprehensive uh, Plan of Action, um, to, that was brokered and then, and then led to this breakthrough in 2016 of the, between the Obama administration and Iran to kind of convince Iran to not create a nuclear, uh, nu nuclear bombs in return for uh, being again connected to the, to the world economy. Um, that was started, the negotiations for that were started in and through Oman. And just four days ago, we get another news that Oman is apparently again added, and that there are again um, negotiations going on in Muscat between a US delegation and an Iranian delegation to find a way to go back to the JCPOA. Now, much of these um, negotiations were going on in Vienna uh, until basically the war in, uh, in, in Ukraine and also kind of put a stop to that, unfortunately, as a, a kind of collateral damage. But now it seems. Um, if this is true, if this is actually true, it's four days old and it's based upon uh, people familiar with the matter. That's always like a kind of a red flag. But if, if it's true and it's believable in the sense that o Oman has been very good at doing these kind of initiatives in the Middle East, Oman didn't take a position between uh, Iran and Iraq in the, 19, in the 1980s when they were at war. Um, Oman kept out of, of, out of most um, uh, international disputes, except for the war uh, against Kuwait, when there was actually a UN resolution um, to stop uh, to, to stop Iran uh, Iraq's invasion of Kuwait. But uh, apart from that, they were always on the uh, kept a low profile and used their position to achieve in diplomacy what states are often what neutral states are often able to to talk to both sides and kind of help broker an agreement. It, it never works when they're on their own, but if both sides kind of have a willingness, then sometimes these, uh, these neutral actors can become the, the, the oil that greases the wheels of diplomacy. And uh, Oman is doing that very successfully uh, again at the moment. Um, but again, they don't call themselves neutral, but there's a lot of people who analyze it or, or interpret it as Oman being, uh, being neutral. Now, there's another, there's another type of neutral, and, and I apologize for the picture. I do, I do realize this looks like a horrible spider web. Mm -hmm. But um, I was describing occasional neutrality of states that sometimes remain uh, neutral or not. Then we have another type, which is those that promise to be neutral always. Like the example, the standard example in Europe, of course, Switzerland, um, Austria, and Ireland, who, who all three have this neutrality policy as part of their, um, of their principles. And for them, the difference, the difference is that permanent neutrals promise to remain neutral in the future towards conflicts that they don't even know yet. Or they, they say, like, we don't have a conflict yet. All of my partners are currently in peaceful relations with each other, but this peaceful relation could deteriorate. And even if it does, I will still maintain my neutrality. So that's the... And that's how even, even permanent neutrals are kind of motivated, or the basic, the core, is that they promise something about a future conflict, a potential future conflict. Um, which leads me to my argument number two, which is that neutrality is anywhere and everywhere um, a reaction to a conflict in one way or another, um, concrete or, or, or potential. And here it's really, really important that we have two possible paradigms to think about war, and these two paradigms and influence whether or not you would consider neutrality an option or not. The first one is the just war paradigm of international relations. Um, 
George, uh, George W. Bush, um, who in 2002 uh, declared the war against terror and declared that you're either with us or you're against us. Because we are fighting uh, a war, we're fighting a war of justice, we are defending, and if, if, if we have a, we, we, if you have a an, an concept where war itself is, is a crime, because under just war theory, you have always a perpetrator, right? Whenever war happens, it happens because one state attacks another, or one entity attacks another, and that's the crime. And fighting back is not, is not a crime. So that's actually also true under the United Nations Charter, uh, Article 51. Ukraine is legally allowed to fight back, to use lethal force to defend against the invasion uh, from Russia. And that's, the Ukrainians are not in breach of international law. It's the Russians that are in breach, because they are, in a, they, are in, they are attacking. And under Article 51, the Ukraine also has the right to defend co collectively with other states. So they are not in breach. The Russians are in breach. And um, the entirety of international relations is, is such that you always must have an attacker, always an aggressor, and always a defender. And the defender always has the right to defend himself or themselves. Um, the problem is then usually, <laughs> you know, the war, the war against uh, Ira uh, Iraq in 2003 was also framed as the United States defending itself uh, preemptively against an imminent attack from Saddam Hussein because he has weapons of mass destruction. So defending ourselves abroad is also part of self-defense. Therefore, it's fine. That's where then the whole construct usually breaks apart because, of course, guess what Russia is arguing? Russia is arguing we are helping the Donbas uh, regions to defend themselves, so we are not in breach, it's the Ukrainians who are in breach. So just war theory or the whole concept has, it, has, has huge flaws. But the point is, if you think about war as good against evil, angels against demons, um, right against wrong, then the conceptual space for neutrality is basically zero. And you would then end up in the argument saying, like, not supporting the good side of a, of a war is equal to supporting the bad side. Therefore, you neutrals, we have to do with you what the Athenians did with, with the Valians. We have to get rid of you, right? You are part of the problem if you're not with us. So under the just war conception, there's, there's really just no space. Um, then there's the other concept of international law. Um, good old Mr. Clausewitz, who famously said, war is the continuation of politics by other means. Uh, that's especially the concept of the 19th century, right, of what war is. Sometimes you manage to get what you want on the negotiating table, sometimes you don't, and if you don't, you go to war, and then you try to get it through that. Um, so if that's the concept of how you look at what war itself is, um, then you, would, you are naturally also prone to understand that for the neutrals, remaining neutral at a war is just a continuation of politics by the same means. You just don't, they just don't change anything. And, you know, not going to war is just as legitimate as going to war when, when you have something to win or nothing to win. And the important thing here is that the, the inter, uh, much of the international law that we have, especially the hate conventions and so on, that enshrine you know, some of the neutrality uh, law, uh, laws that we have, they were made under the old paradigm. Um, they were made at a moment when we thought of war as something unfortunate. We don't really like it. But when it happens, the best thing we can do is to contain it. So we try to outlaw um, uh, targeting civilians, or we outlaw certain implements of war, like certain kinds of bullets, certain kinds of weapons that cause just, just unnecessary hurt. So we make these illegal, but war itself, we don't make it illegal. And that, that whole concept changed after the First World War, and we went to the world that we're living in now, where we basically said war itself is outlawed, and war itself is a war crime. Um, as as compared to just certain acts of warfare in war are a crime. And neutrality has always flourished under this, uh, under this kind of uh, mindset and has always had a very, very difficult stance under, um, under the just war paradigm. And it really depends on how you think about a war, whether or not you will think it's legitimate to, to remain neutral or not. Um, and then the nature of con uh, still the nature of conflict also de determines the the nature of neutrality. Here I have this very interesting graph. You know, um, there's this tool called Google Ingram Viewer. You can use it for free on Google. And um, it, what it allows you to do is to search every single word that Google has scanned over the last 20 years in Google Books. Right? They have scanned like millions of books, uh, tens of millions of books. 
and they, have in, they can index these words. And then you can search how often does this word appear compared to all other words that appear at, in that year. And then you can write little graphs about like, how often was that word used over time, which is quite lovely. And here, if you look at the, the blue line, which is like the word or the, the phrase like neutral country, what you see is it always, neutral country always spikes up around, you know, this is right after, during and after the Napoleonic Wars, Crimean War, the First World War, the Second World War, and then it kind of tapers out the numbers of mentions and how often Google has, uh, it appears in Google. But we have other concepts that are sudden, suddenly born, and this is really interesting. You have the word neutralism that really doesn't exist up until right at the end of the Second World War. Only once the World War ends, the concept, the idea that, you, that neutrality could be an ism starts appearing and rapidly. And the other one is the word non-alignment. No non-alignment in the 1930s, 20s, no non-alignment in, in the 1840s, and then suddenly non-alignment in, in the 50s. And this makes complete sense because the nature of the Cold War, the Cold War is a very different war. I mean, first of all, it's a misnomer because the Cold War is basically a period, not an actual war, right? It's, it's a very new thing, a new way how international relations works. But it's the nature of that conflict. When the Cold War suddenly is not anymore a hot shooting war between armies, but between ideologies, where capitalism fights communism, well, what's a neutral position between that well, it's another ism, so it's, it's, it's neutralism. So this, this whole concept of neutralism was basically born out, of the, out of, the, of the fact that there were certain groups that didn't, that didn't want to, to be part of these, of these isms, and then they conceptualized themselves and were conceptualized by the others as basically also being themselves part of an ism. And interestingly enough, uh, neutralism uh, was born first before non-alignment, and then, uh, then the non-aligned movement kind of took off and um, had basically at the core of its of its existence, trying not to be part of either of the two big um, uh, um, spheres, right? The, uh, neither the, the capitalist West nor the, nor, nor the communist East, although it gets very, very murky there, so maybe we can talk about this later. Where does this leave us today? Well, in this book um, on uh, Neutral Beyond the Cold, I had this map where, I tried, where we tried to kind of color different countries according to how new, uh, what kind of neutrality they were using. So dark blue is basically states that have neutral neutrality clauses in their constitution. We've got basically Malta, Switzerland, Austria, Mol uh, Moldova, Turkmenistan that belong to this group. The Vatican would belong to it too. It's just too small to make a point out of it. <laughs> um, and then we have the, the, other, the other ones, a, a little bit light, lighter blue, like Sweden, Finland, also Ireland, that basically have it as a foreign policy concept. Interestingly, there are states that developed it since, since the 1990s. Most importantly, certainly um, Mongolia, that in 2015, kind of at the UN, declared that, yeah, we are thinking now about whether we want to be neutral or not, and have very successfully kind of maintained that at, um, at the moment. And we've had discussions inside like a lot of ASEAN countries to revive the so-called zone of peace, freedom, and neutrality that, that they built in the 1970s, and then kind of went into oblivion and kind of started coming up again. And there's, there's good arguments about the fact that they're still thinking about this. I mean, even, even in Taiwan, this is a, a different story, though. I mean, the, the, light, the light green means that there's active discussions going on among, among certain groups. Even in Taiwan, we had a politician, a former vice president, who had the idea to make Taiwan a neutral island and kind of not talk about independent Taiwan anymore, but neutral Taiwan. Although she did that for about five years, and by now the, the whole uh, action has died down, so I think that one is gone, gone for good. But you know, for Southeast Asia, they are still in that, in that kind of predicament. What do we do? Who do we side with? Um, and this is, this is very much, um, for, the, for the moment, I would say, unresolved. And when we look at, at Europe, you have, um, we have now, of course, a, a, re a really big change. I mean, even for Ukraine. There was, at least since 2014, since the invasion of Crimea, from Noam Chomsky on the very left all the way to Henry Kissinger, who's now 100 years old, uh, there were a lot of realist thinkers who said Ukraine has to be neutral. It needs to be a neutral country in order to de-escalate the situation, and that never materialized. So today, the um, neutral states in Europe more or less look like, look like this, although I'm not quite sure about whether it's still okay to put Georgia into the group where, that has a 
a neutrality discussion because it's pretty clear that they would join the European Union and, and probably also NATO if they could as soon as possible. Um, the, so, I mean, this is an ongoing situation, but definitely inside Europe, the number of states that would still kind of talk about neutrality policy has, has drastically decreased. Um, but when it comes to, to the war in Ukraine and, and to the global picture, I am just not sure where everything is headed. So here you can see the countries that, that deliver weapons, that have like pledged weapons to, to Ukraine. And what you see, and, and it's very similar to the sanctions question, most countries around the world, about two thirds of people live in countries that neither export weapons nor put sanctions on, uh, on Russia. Uh, and this also has been described as kind of a neutral stance toward it. And this has this is currently, as we are speaking, creating a lot of a lot of debate and discussion. Um, so whether we should call this a neutral approach or, or not, I'm not quite sure yet. But I I certainly interpret it as such. Um, first and foremost, because we have a couple of developing states that very explicitly use this framework of like we are neither we want to be friends with both and we are not we don't want to choose and, um, uh, at the moment. And I would like to show you a three minute clip. Um, from last year, June, when the foreign minister of India was having a really hard time to make this reporter understand that he doesn't accept this, the, the, the dichotomy, and you have to choose between us or between them. So p please just have a listen. And, you know, this line of trying to, to make Western leaders understand that India is neither with the Russians nor against them, nor with the US nor, nor against them, continues just like last week. He was again, this is just 12 seconds, he was again trying to make the point. India currently just refuses to be pushed into a corner where it has to choose. So it says, I have my own position and I will defend that based upon um, the necessity of the moment. And this is my very last kind of case study and I will, I will um, in, end it quickly. I mean, even for, in Switzerland, the situation at the moment led to a re-evaluation, of course, of where Switzer, Switzerland's neutrality stands. And the Swiss have been trying to say, like, look, when it comes to the hot shooting war, we will keep to the law of neutrality and we will, we will not, I mean, we will keep to, 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 the good, to the good old laws and we will neither allow Ukrainians to cross our territory nor Russians, which is kind of, yeah, I mean, it doesn't really make a lot of sense, but yeah, that's it. But, but when it comes to the, to the morals of it all, we will, we will choose side. I mean, uh, you, Switzerland um, has put sanctions. On, on Russia, exactly the same as the EU, and the Russians have been quite quite angry about that. And the uh, the uh, well, the economic uh, the economically, but also politically, like moral, uh, morally, like they, they support um, the the, uh, the defense of Ukraine at the moment. I mean, this is our uh, Minister of Defense uh, meeting, Mr. Stoltenberg, and you know, Switzerland has been has, has been trying to signal. Uh, very much that morally they support the cause of the of the of the of the alliance and of uh, defending Ukraine, but legally they don't. So they've refrained from actually sending weapons. And actually, for the third time, Parliament has rejected the idea of um, changing Swiss laws to allow for uh, sending sending weapons. It's this. Um, and la but lastly, this this kind of Switzerland, uh, the Swiss, some part of the political uh, uh, political groups standing very much with the European Union has now led to a backlash where like other another group is is uh, threw in a referendum saying like okay we want to vote about this and they've started an initiative that Switzerland should redefine its neutrality and should actually for the first time define it in the constitution. So its neutrality is two times appears in the Swiss constitution, but it's never defined. It just appears as a word, oh, Switzerland is neutral, blah. What does it mean? It means nothing. And so these people actually wrote a four-part four, four uh, um, amendment to the constitution, and uh, they have another one year to gather enough signatures. If they get enough signatures, the government has to, has to hold a public referendum, and if the referendum comes through, then that these, these four clauses will be added to the Swiss constitution. Um, and this is this is an ongoing process. The, the earliest most possible moment is next week, uh, next year, that this could be voted on probably only in 2025. But we see how this 
how the war in Ukraine has also in Switzerland now led to kind of a what 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 is this uh, what is this neutrality and it will lead to a redefinition. I mean, in, even in Switzerland, neutrality could go away and anyone can give it up. Um, or it might lead to a strengthening of it because the people who, who do this referendum, they say like, no, we have to define our neutrality in a way that it also excludes putting sanctions on other countries because sanctions are actually a means of warfare and we shouldn't, we shouldn't participate in that. So you have like different visions um, competing at the moment. Um, so in conclusion, neutrality is moving out of Europe but probably um, into other parts of the world in new shapes. Uh, countries with hard neutrality laws keep this foreign policy more readily than those without. Most developing nations are trying to maintain a multidirectional foreign policy at the moment. And in the coming multipolar system, we should probably expect more neutrality policies, not less, but adapted to the conflicts that they will be direct directed toward. Uh, that's what I would, sorry for almost doing an hour. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we'll have time for Q&A. I think the advantage of the chair and of controlling the room to ask first questions. But thank you very much, Pascal, for this. Um, you know, what, one comment, of course, it was amusing to see the Indian foreign minister talk about China and India while Chinese soldiers and Indians have been killing each other and while India has done everything it can to get US weapons. So that's mm -hmm. kind of a parenthesis. But I have a historical question. Uh, you mentioned, I think rightly so, that it's very hard to have perfect neutrality, that always looks like you're signing towards one side. But I think if we look at the Cold War and we look at three neutral actors, I mean, the Vatican under John Paul II was clearly not neutral. Yeah. I mean, I don't think anybody in Moscow was saying, oh, John Paul II, yeah, he's totally neutral. No, I mean, the guy was 100% on the other side, and, and therefore the Vatican, because he was a head of state. And I think if you look at Switzerland and Sweden, too, I mean, it's hard. We don't know exactly how much intelligence sharing there was, but we have to assume that there was a lot more with the West than with the Soviets. Yeah. Uh, all their political system was such that from a Marxist-Leninist perspective, they were enemy countries. I mean, they were liberal capitalist democracies. Their weapons came from there. Uh, there was a famous incident that came to light well after the end of the Cold War, where USSR 71 had engine problems with the Baltic, you know, Sweden scrambled planes to make sure the Soviets wouldn't shoot it down. I mean, there are lots of cases where I think we could say that Sweden and Switzerland, yes, they weren't fully NATO, but it's hard to see that they were neutral, even though they performed sometimes the role of neutral countries uh, you know, for meetings and whatever. Uh, but I don't know if you want to respond to this, and then open it to Q&A. The, the problem is, is always the same. Neutrality is never properly defined. You know, we all have an intuitive feeling of what we think of what neutrality is, which means like not doing either and kind of like, you know, being perfectly equidistant. But it, that never that never works. And the, the, the neutrality is never outcome neutral, you know. The neutrality will always benefit one of two sides more. At every case you look, there will always be somebody who has more to win. That's why I was speaking of Finland as being having a, a neutrality that was pro-Soviet, because it was well understood that Finnish neutrality, I mean, uh, people like, like uh, um, Uro Kekon and so on understood that their neutrality has to serve the defensive purposes of the Soviet Union, and that in return will that allow them not to be part of the Warsaw Pact and do, some, do something more. And the, the Swiss and also the Austrians and the Swedes in, in the Cold War were not ideologically neutral. Ideologically, they were, like now, in the camp of the West. They said, we will adhere to neutrality law, but neutrality law at that point is kind of, you know, so what... What, what does it mean? I mean, it, it was, a, again, it was a concept that kind of came from an older paradigm from the 19th century and didn't have that much bearing anymore. And they un interpreted very differently. It, funny, funny anecdote, like the, Austria became neutral in 1955 after they went to Moscow and said, hey, can you finally take your troops out of here? We would like to have a country again. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the Russians said, you can have it if you promise us that you will be neutral like Switzerland. And they signed a memorandum saying, like, okay, we will be neutral like Switzerland. Um, actually, the Soviets left in 55. Um, uh, um, uh, a few days later, the Austrians were very, like, law-abiding. They put that into their, uh, into their laws they had in Parliament. They lived up to it. And uh, two months later, they joined the United Nations. Switzerland did not join the United Nations until 2002 because they argued it's not compatible with our neutrality. 
Of course, it's compatible. It depends on how you define it. And the Austrians defined it as this is fine. And actually, they, they joined the UN with the, the, the Russian, uh, the Soviets were, of course, fine with that. Um, and the Swiss didn't. So they have, you have very different definitions of what this neutrality means. And you're absolutely right. I mean, ideologically, they were neutral. But they, they still said, we will not join military alliances. And in the Cold War, a lot of the neutrality debate came, came to be centered around um, are you in an alliance? Yes or no. If you're not, then you're either neutral or non-aligned. And if you are, then you belong to either one of the blocs. And that's what the Swedes also rejected, saying, like, we won't do that one. OK, well, so we have time for about half an hour of Q&A. Uh, so speak now, all your peace forever. Well, <laughs> even if you speak, do all your peace. Uh, who has a question? I promise it was OK. If you can just introduce yourself. And, uh, yeah, my name is Chris. Uh, just a, maybe a question about the changing nature of conflict, because um, I know nothing about neutrality. State. Well, now I know a little something. But, um, it seems like it's a, a school of thinking or a body of thought that primarily has like military or potentially military conflict in mind, when it seems to me that economic conflict is rapidly becoming the more important set of questions. Obviously, military conflict still matters, and the uh, Ukraine is a great example. But the real, the real conflict is US-China economic conflict, and that's only going to get more divisive. As the reporter was trying to push on the uh, Indian uh, foreign minister, um, I'm just wondering what, how the academic uh, community of neutrality studies is, is grappling with, with that shift in, in the nature of global conflict. It depends a bit on who you talk to. The biggest problem, so I'm trying to make neutrality studies a thing in the sense that I argue we should we should look at the phenomenon like across time periods. Mm -hmm. Until now, what you have is experts on the Cold War, experts on the Second World Second World War, neutrality, First World War, 19th century, but there's really very few people who try to do to, to make an arc. But what's interesting is that the origin the Right now, if you go and read the Hague Conventions, a lot of it is about warfare, as you're correctly saying, and you know that was 1907. So how, how do states behave during war on land? But that's actually not where it was born from. Um, neutrality in international law was born 700 years ago in the Mediterranean when there, when there was the need to define what can states trade with those states that are at war with each other. So a lot of neutrality law actually pertains to the question of what is contraband? Can can belligerent countries seize the 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 um, the goods enemy goods on neutral ships, or can they seize neutral ships with um, with e with enemy enemy goods on neutral ships, or neutral goods on enemy ships? What happens with those? A lot of that is comes out comes actually out of that discussion. So I mean, n n trade was always very very closely connected to the to the warfare. Uh, issue. If you think about Napoleon, I mean, a large part was his idea was like, let's just switch, uh, let's just cut off the British from the from the rest of the of the European continent and starve them, uh, the continental system. And then they want they told the Americans, you cannot trade with these guys anymore. And the Americans said, like, no, we will, <laughs> because we are neutral and we can, and that's, that's what we can do. And if you start, if you try to search our ships, you have problems. We will have problems with us. Um, so um, trade. And warfare have always been very closely linked, and they are even now. So this is, this is very classical in the sense that um, a certain group of countries tries to tell another group, um, stop trading with them. We're going to starve them. And traditionally, it doesn't usually work, because like, there's a, the trading interests are very, very strong. You can see that at the moment as well. So, but it's a, it's a very good observation. Thank you. Well, there's a question. Carlo? Uh, I'm Caleb. Thanks again for the talk. I had a lot of questions, but you, you answered them as you talked. So I'm, <laughs> and then that was one of mine as well, Chris. So thanks. But I have a, uh, at least one more here. Is the opinion of a neutral country held in higher regard towards a, maybe not a security issue, but an economic issue, a health issue, another moral issue? Or is their opinion just as good as anyone else's? Because, yeah. So, yeah, I'll leave it at that as an example. No, I think at the end of the day, neutral countries are just countries, so their opinions matter as all the others do, and other countries usually look at them with just as much suspicion. 
Um, you know, some countries are able to kind of carve out an, a certain identity. I mean, the Swiss were very successful in kind of kind of selling to the world the idea that they're also the capital of like humanitarianism and have the Red Cross there and so on. And uh, so Geneva is often chosen as a seat of international uh, relations. And uh, the, the, the Austrians after 55 were very good at that too. That's why the International Atomic Agency is in Vienna. Even OPEC is headquartered in Vienna because they kind of distrust each other too much. So they said, let's put it, let's go to a neutral, <laughs> let's go to a neutral space. Um, so perception, of course, matters very much. But I think at the end, you know, the neutrals always fight with the problem that while they try to to tell everybody else we want to be friends with all of you, usually, especially when wars get very hot, the, the belligerents will look at them as, oh, you're not with us. So you're almost with the enemy. Huh? And that, that often overwrites quite a lot of what that they can do, and once once tensions die down, people forget about these these negative things, and then the good thing like the Red Cross and so on remain, and opinions become positive again. They don't necessarily have more soft power than anybody else. They try, they try, because unless you are a neutral great power, which happened especially in the nineteenth century, the British often declared their neutrality when a couple of others were fighting with each other. Um, unless you're a great power, you, I mean, soft power is like one of the best things you can go for, um, apart from also like having a, some defensive structures and so on. Yeah, yeah. makes sense. Thanks. Okay, next. Okay, yeah, you, and then here, okay, perfect. Yeah, you can introduce yourself. Hello, my name is Heather. Thank you, that was really interesting. I'm wondering, as a Swiss person, when you go back and you look at what your parents or grandparents we're talking about or thinking, what was the Swiss's personal reaction knowing that they did business with the Nazis? I mean, this is a topic that became very, very acute in the 1990s. That's when the big reckoning came. Um, and I remember this as a time of revelations when things came out that we were not aware of. I mean, that the fact that you had uh, Nazi gold, including tooth fillings, coming to Switzerland and then being accepted by the Swiss National Bank. That was that, those were shocking revelations. Um, on the on the other hand, like even now, the being a neutral country in the Second World War is still looked upon as something that was beneficial, that was good, and you know. My grandfather was born in a very funny year, in 1896, which means he was 18 in 1914, and he was 43 in 1939, and he was drafted twice to stand at the border and wait to see whether the Germans would you know, want to peep over or not. Um, I wouldn't be here if they did. Um, so you know, a lot of Swiss are aware that being, being spared both calamities, the First and the Second World War, was very, very important. And um, while at the same time, you cannot escape the moral dilemma. I mean, as a neutral, you will always be in, in, in the moral dilemma that you will, have, you will be doing business with several sides, unless you really want to side only with one. But it will come with that. Does that answer the question? Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, most of what I've read recently on great power rivalries, uh, which is kind of related to this neutrality in the new Cold War, is very Europe-centric. It does, because there's a great power in, in Asia, or two, one or two, anyway, um, Asia's involved. Uh, but there's nothing, you, you're saying basically nothing uh, about Africa or South America. Yes. Um, is that by design, those the African countries are too new to be involved, or does your does your theory apply to them as well? No, I um I, I should I mean South the position of South Africa, the position of Brazil, and also increasingly what Mexico is trying to do, it it fits in, into exactly that. I tried to do it with India. Um, <clears throat> most African countries are saying no, we're just not putting sanctions. We we re, we actually are non-aligned on, on this issue, and they try very hard to to sell the idea that they are just not going to choose, and they continue having relations with uh, with Russia. I mean, South Africa at the moment is being criticised for 
uh, having too much cooperation with it. The U.S. is now saying, oh, we have the suspicion that some of your weapons ended up uh, in, in the hands of the Russians, which would, be, which would be a red line, and we will punish you for that if that's true. Um, while at the same time, of course, like U.S. weapons, one hundred billion in the in the hands of the other belligerent, are an act of of good, etc. You know, you have again this this good bad scheme, and South Africans are saying like no, and probably they will might will probably even host Vladimir Putin in August uh, for um, uh, for for a meeting there, for which they're also being for which they're also being criticized. But the Africans are the South African president is saying if it helps to, to if we can somehow help broker a broker a peace, that's what we want. We don't want to indict uh, Putin. And so they do exactly the same. And I'm sorry if you have more time, we should do that. I mean, they are actually very important, and one of the reasons why currently also some of the sanctions are not going the way that they are designed is because. Latin America, Africa, and most of East A Asia and East Asia, they have their economic capacities uh, and the Russian uh, ability to actually access them and go through them is much bigger than what previously was thought in the West was possible. So the sanctions are not biting mainly because of the, the neutral way out that, that the Russians now have. If that makes sense. Um, yes, there. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Dujardic to invite such a wonderful professor Pascal. Thank you very much. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, in order to have peace in the world, uh, I think we should read the wonderful books of Pascal, your sister, <laughs> <laughs> the famous philosopher Pascal. If we read Pascal, maybe we can solve many problems. Uh, another point. Could, could you ask a question? Uh, uh, no. Uh, another point. May I see at the last part, please, of the Swiss mentality picture? The, uh, yes. This is a fantastic picture. Do you know why the students, if they might, the students answer, please. What is this? What is special about this uh, beautiful picture? The students. Well, if you, if you could ask a question to ask a question like this. Uh, like well, the, the olive branch, she is in the world. Did he find his mother? The pigeon at the time of Noah. The. So if we can have a pigeon yeah. with the olive branch every day. Because your, your background is Judeo-Christian studies, right? So that's... Oh, well, uh, this is uh, history and plus a wonderful symbol, the pigeon with the olive branch. So if we can uh, look at it every day, many problems will be solved. Thank yeah, you. and you. you know this, um, the, 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 the committee that, I, that tries to have this referendum come through, that are pushing for this at the moment, of course they connect neutrality with peace. Uh, which is a way to to appeal to the to the to the Swiss public. The interesting thing, maybe as a as a side note, is that this is not coming from the left wing of Switzerland. This is the right wing at the moment, the People's Party that's launching this, which says, um, yeah, we have uh, we have a lot to lose if we if we throw throw our lot with uh, with one of the two sides. Um, the Social Democrats, which are usually the, the, the pro-peace party and the pacifist party, which in the First World War rejected uh, uh, Switzerland, even defending Switzerland itself, like, okay, we should get rid of all military, uh, they are the people who are in, in favor of uh, sending weapons to Ukraine, which is very interesting. So politically, this, the, the conflict has kind of inversed the poles somehow in Swiss, in Swiss mm -hmm. political process, just as a side note. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's something we've seen throughout Europe. Yeah. And the yeah. extreme right yeah. is much closer to Putin yeah. than the left. I have a new, I think it's interesting one thing because we're here in Tokyo is very often I think Japanese who have embraced the idea of neutrality have not understood that neutrality is very different from not being armed. That neutrality is very often armed neutrality. Uh, Switzerland or Sweden during the Cold War being very good examples. I mean, yeah, yeah. I, I love, uh, it's funny, like a lot of people mis mis mistaken neutrality and pacifism. Mm -hmm. They're two very different concepts. And the fact that then Japan has a pacifist constitution, although a very well armed pacifist constitution, it, Japan is the eighth, has the eighth largest uh, military, or like fire, uh, in terms of firepower, the eighth largest. It's like uh, in the firepower index, it's one step in front of France. Right? It's like it's, it is a big army, it is a well, well like equipped uh, military complex, but like the fact that 
it is framed as pacifist often leads also um, abroad to, to questions, oh, is Japan neutral? And I would say that clearly not, because this, the, 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 the US-Japan alliance is like, it's, it's a hard alliance, right? You, you strike together, so that would preclude it from most definitions of, of neutrality. Um, and also inside Japan, yeah, there's, there's this perception. But you know the interesting thing? The interesting thing is 1960, with the Anpo protests, when the, the largest political protests since the Second World War, and ever since, actually, they, these people were protesting being in an alliance with the United States. And the only other, the only other option that would have been around for Japan would have been what uh, Mr. MacArthur actually envisaged, envisaged Japan should be after the Second World War, which is why he wrote the pacifist article, which is neutral. MacArthur thought Japan should be neutral. It didn't become so. And in the 1960s, again, you have like books in, written in 57, 58, 59, uh, what the Japanese neutrality would mean. And that didn't happen. But it's interesting that you have that discussion here, too. And one of my points is, well, you know, the only thing that I can tell you with certainty as a historian is that nothing in the world lasts forever. So the, the, the US-Japan alliance has been lasting for 70 years, which is a long time, and it might last another 70, it might last another 140, but it will come to an end eventually. And the question to me is, what will Japan do at that point? Will it go a neutral route? Will it be in, in an alliance with China or with Russia? I mean, what's it going to be? But, you know... You either have an alliance or you, you go it alone. And if you go it alone, you often end up in that kind of neutral conundrum. <laughs> so mm, it's going to be. Know, alliances can last a long time. When, a British, when Winston Churchill addressed the House of Commons to announce that Portugal was supposed to be neutral and mm -hmm. actually decided to allow the UK and the US to use the Azores, mm -hmm. he invoked the Anglo Portuguese alliance yep. of the 14th century. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, and so we have a question. Right. Uh, again, um, I don't know if you, so thank you for your fantastic talk, by the way. But the, since you brought up Japan, as you said, Japan is clearly not a neutral state due to the due to these alliance. due to the structural factors such as the U.S.-Japan alliances, uh, due to the U.S.-Japan alliance amongst many other factors. But there's one thing uh, when you take a look, uh, and I, I was asking myself this question on the way here. When you take a look at uh, Japanese foreign policy uh, over the past 50 years, there's one thing. Uh, like the Ukraine conflict uh, does not fit into that. But even though Japan has always been part of the um, US-led global order and has always been quite vocal, uh, uh, putting, uh, putting itself uh, in, the group, uh, in, in the group of the uh, US-led order, um, being uh, you know, openly uh, condemning human rights abuses all around the world. At the same time, there's been many criticisms as having a very sort of promiscuous foreign policy, being very, uh, on the rhetorical side, uh, condemning actions, but at the same time, not following or not, not necessarily doing uh, economic, uh, putting economic sanctions on other countries, or condemning, um, condemning human rights abuses in China, but still um, approving dictatorships in Indonesia in the 70s, still being friends with Burma. Um, is this, um, I, I, was, I was asking myself, is being vocal, uh, being rhetorically non-neutral, but not having the actions that follow, still doing business with, uh, with, all this, with all these countries, not doing the same thing as uh, what many of your um, Western interlocutors, which do both things, right, which is implement economic sanctions, for example, or try to completely uh, isolate countries, not, not, not taking every single step um, in, the, um, in being part of the liberal order. Is that a form of you know, Japanese, like neutrality with Japanese characteristics in a way? Is this, it's... Is this, it, it, has this ever been talked about in neutrality studies? I, I, sorry. I, no, it's, it's, a good, uh, no, it's a good, it's a good, it's a good, it's a good question. It makes totally sense. You know what I'm, what I'm doing here is basically I'm pitching kind of an alternative way of looking at countries instead of looking at them as what a lot of people in IR would say is like the saying like oh they're balancing or they're hedging. It's like you know Japan is kind of it's kind of hedging uh, by. In, by in, still engaging Myanmar and, and so on and not fully like uh, integrating into the, well, at having policies that differ slightly from what would be a preferred policy in Washington and so on. 
Um, and you could call it, I, I would not actually put the neutrality label on it because it seems that the basics, you know, this kind of, okay, we are not completely military integrating with another power that, because that one is not there. But it, it's, um, it's a very valid obs observation. And, and um, I, would be, I would be interested in reading the argument, for, for instance, like uh, uh, oh, how many instances you could find where you could say, like, a new, an, although Japan is in, an, in a military alliance, in all of these instances, it actually uh, acted very similar to how um, some neutral countries or like non-aligned countries acted, especially in comparison to the non-aligned. Japan even took part in the Bandung Conference in 53 when the non-aligned movement was is basically uh, born and so on. So there was there was this moment, especially um, then in the, in the 50s and 60s, but maybe also in the 70s and 80s. So that would be an interesting argument, but I um, I don't know whether it flies or not, but it's a good observation. Um, yes. yes. So <coughs> you could just introduce yourself. Yeah. Uh, my name is Jay, and uh, my question is regarding the just war paradigm, right? So why after the 21st century which was filled with many uh, realist thinkers like uh, Kit, uh, like Henry Kissinger and of course like John Mersheimer, as well as like a general philosophical bent towards uh, amorality and like power politics, as you know, is kind of evidenced by the how many times you know Foucault is cited, right, and how he's very very focused on power and essentially a form of realism, right, uh, and uh, having examples like the Iraq War or Perhaps maybe yeah yeah examples like the Iraq War showing this problem. Why is the just war paradigm still so dominant in modern politics? Well, because it's part it's a very integral part of international law today. Article fifty one <laughs> of the United Nations Charter, like on and the pro prohibition on the use of force under the UN Charter, is is very very strong. And this this prohibition has been reaffirmed time after time and time again. Um, the, the problem we have is that we live in an imperfect world and we have never had world peace. We've, we've always had wars and we've had wars by great powers. Um, the US took the right to attack uh, Iraq. The US still takes the right to occupy a third of Syria. Uh, we have the Russians that take the right to, to, invade, to invade Ukraine. We have uh, NATO that takes the right to have um, forces stationed in Kosovo, which under international law is regarded as part of Serbia, and Serbia is saying, hey guys, we never said it's okay. Um, we have a very, very in imperfect world. With uh, So war and conflict, armed conflict, uh, remain a part of, of the international level. But maybe why the paradigm is here and why we're living under the paradigm is because it's such a good paradigm. It would be great if, we, if, if war and, and armed conflict was actually outlawed. And uh, you can, it's quite, it's quite interesting, you know, China and Russia, they're both constantly framing their actions, together with the United States, they constantly frame them as in accordance with international law. They constantly say, we are not in breach of international law, it's the other one that's in breach. And again, the Russians, their, their reason for the, for the invasion is like, we are just helping the Donbas republics, which we recognize as independent states, to defend themselves from the attacks from Ukraine. It's a twisted argument, but it is an IL and, and, and paradigm-based uh, argument. So I think it's just, A, states don't want to be seen as, bra as breaking law, international law, and B, at the end of the day, the Chinese, the Russians, the, the Americans, the Europeans, the Africans, the South Americans, they agree, it would be nice if it worked. That's my answer, but um, I don't know if I'm a bit cynic about it or not. Okay. Okay. So I'll introduce a few more questions. Do you have any questions? Yes. Uh, my name is Nishimura. Uh, I'm an uh, editorial writer of Hokkaido Shimbun Press. And my question is also about the, your assessment of Japan, the standpoint, standpoint of Japan. Um, actually, I will uh, agree with you uh, that Japan is not neutral because it's, it, it has alliance with the United States, and it is, it is a chair country of G7 this year, and Japan has support to Ukraine and met with the Ukrainian president, not with the Russian president, actually, this year. And, but uh, how do you assess the provision of the Constitution of Japan, actually Article 9, but which renouncing the war? Be, uh, is, if the neutrality is defined with the, is the relation of the conflict, 
actually complex. Uh, there are conflicts about uh, economics and politics and military, but at least in, in the meaning of military, Japan can be said that it is neutral because it renouncing war in the constitution. How do you assess that provision? Um. I mean, first of all, it's a wonderful provision to have in any kind of constitution. I think it's a very, it's a very good one to write it into your basic law that you will never attack another country. Um, on the other hand, it's um, every country around the world, because they bind themselves to the to the UN Charter, actually has it indirectly. Right? The UN Charter says we will never attack. Therefore, they all bind themselves. Therefore, Japan is. It's the only country that actually explicitly writes it into their constitution, but all others on paper say they adhere to the same principle. Um, in the case of Japan, the important thing of the Article 9 is that Japan actually keeps to it. I think, if I'm, if I'm correctly wrong, we don't have, in the last 75 years, a single JSDF member dying abroad. If they die, it's because of helicopter uh, uh, crashes inside the country, but not because they're abroad. So Japan has been very, very, very self-constrained. And that is very that is quite special, because often um, states that create large militaries then have this, you know, you start integrating them and sending them abroad. And you, we have NATO that kind of does out of area uh, uh, um, uh, missions where, they, where we have NATO p uh, troops. We had them in, in Afghanistan. We had them Iraq, and so you know we have, you have them other, uh, in other places. Japan has always been extremely constrained in this regard. So again, I don't think it's a form. Maybe you could make the argument it's a form of it's a form of neutrality in the same sense that that you were talking about before. But it, I really more see it as a as a as an additional part of a corset to constrain Japan's potential mil military power. Because also, I mean, I mean, I view. This, what happened in the Second World War as brought about by military institutions, the, the military, uh, the, the army and the navy running wild. They just started attacking, like, you know, Mukten was nothing that was planned in Tokyo. That was just done on the ground, and then Tokyo had to scramble to kind of say, no, 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 it's OK. Uh, a lot of Pearl Harbor is different, but, but, but a lot of these things were just brought about by, by military institutions that were completely out of control. Um, and this article still, I mean, it's still a corset on any kind of potential militarism. Not, not, not planned, but you know, sometimes you accidentally land in a militarist spiral. Um, so I view that as a good thing. Should we say that Japan is neutral in terms of military? You could, you could, Please. you could make the argument if you again, because neutrality is notoriously bad defined. Very, very poorly defined. I would not include Japan because there is a hard military security alliance. On the other hand, if you read the alliance, it says Japan has to help the United States to shoot back at an enemy if US troops are attacked on Japanese soil. That's the reason why, you know, uh, if uh, a US, a US uh, a Navy ship was attacked on open waters by like any kind of enemy, and the Japanese ship was next to it, it wouldn't have had the constitutional, the, 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 the legal reason, the, re, the, the legal backdrop to actually help the US ship. And that's what Mr. Abe changed in 2015 by reinterpreting the, the constitution and putting that in writing, saying, no, no, under this circumstances we will. But the treaty itself actually says Japan will only shoot back in together if the um, if, it, if the attack happens on or in Japanese soil, that's why like, if there's an attack on, on San Francisco or New York, according to the treaty, the US, the Japan could just say that, not my business. So in, in that sense, you could actually make the argument, I, I believe. It would be maybe not an easy one to sell, but you could make the argument that the Japan is in some form could be neutral, or even, on, even with the treaty. But again, you could stretch the definition quite large, quite far. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Any other questions? Or? Yes. My name is Yuyang. I wanted to ask you a question about China. So I wouldn't say that China keeps neutrality about the conflict between Ukraine and Russia. And what do you think, what position China takes in this conflict? Because, you know, uh, at first uh, Xi Jinping met Putin in Moscow and then he's on a call with Zelensky. Mm -hmm. So it looks more like not neutrality, but the double game. Well, you know, I. I believe the argument of a very good Chinese scholar in the US, his name is Yu Bin, and he wrote an article about China's principled neutrality, saying, like, look, 
uh, it makes no sense to conceptualize what Russia and, 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 and China are doing as an alliance, because if that's an alliance, we need a new word for what NATO is, or for what the US-Japan alliance is. I mean, China is cooperating economically um, a, lo a lot with Russia, but China also, that's the interesting thing, has not a bad relationship with Ukraine, which is why Xi Jinping was able to be on a phone call with Zelensky, and the only, not peace, um, proposal, but the only roadmap to peace that was not rejected, neither by Moscow nor by Kiev, came from, from China, um, because China can talk to both. And even Zelensky said, okay, we're not rejecting it out of hand. It was only rejected in, in, in Washington, right, as a, as a non-starter and so on. But it's, it's, in that sense, I do see the, the Chinese as being, well, let's say, if, if neutrality and, 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 and complete integration or a complete alliance, if it's a spectrum and not just a yes or no, then I would see the Chinese definitely on the more neutral side at the moment. Um, not in the sense that they try to be to do good on earth, etc. It's very self-interested, but I would see it more on the neutral side than on the alliance side. Thank you. Any other questions? One, two, three. I have one question. Who are QJ students here? Anybody a QJ student? Okay, QJ students, and you're at the British school. Okay, good. Well, welcome. We were happy to have students from the British school. Thank you for coming to TUJ. We're happy to have you as neighbors. So, uh, thank you again, Pascal. Thank you for your interest, so, everybody. Thank you very much. Uh, if, if you want to be on our email list, you can email us at icast.tujtemple.edu. And uh, we'll put you on our email list for future events. Uh, we have several uh, coming up soon. Uh, one on the financing of pensions in Japan. Everybody here is young, so it's a problem for them. Uh, second one uh, with Andrew Oros uh, on grain and defense, basically on how East Asian societies, where there are only old people and the young people left, uh, are going to define their defense and security policy. Um, and uh, we have other activities uh, in July as well. So thanks again. Um, and thank you to our student workers for uh, recording this for posterity. Thanks again. Thank you, thank thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, if you're interested, I have a YouTube channel. Just Google for neutrality studies. <laughs> thank you.